Radio Voice Italia. Philadelphia. Class is now in session. Christopher Columbus University is on air from Philadelphia and broadcasting worldwide from within the shadow of Marconi Plaza. Radio Voice Italia is proud to present a recurring segment with civil rights author, professional researcher, and renowned Christopher Columbus expert, Robert Felix Petron Esquire. Buongiorno tutti and welcome to Radio Voice Italia's Christopher Columbus University, where we teach you the truth about the greatest hero of the 15th and 16th centuries, Christopher Columbus, and update you on the international efforts to preserve Christopher Columbus's legacy. I'm your host, Il Professore, Robert Petron. Today, on our Christopher Columbus University segment in the continuing persecution of Italian Americans, the National Shrine of St. Rita of Cascia in the Italian American neighborhood of South Philadelphia, a church that was built in 1907 specifically for Italian immigrants, was desecrated recently. In yet another attempt at the damnatio memoriae, Italian Americans are suffering across the world, including the worldwide removal of holidays and statues of Christopher Columbus based on the false myth that Columbus was a racist, rapist, maimer, murderer, slaver, slave owner, grifter, and genocide heir. And also the recent rash of burning and other vandalizations of Catholic churches across the world. Burglars picked the padlock on the courtyard grotto of the St. Rita's National Shrine in a Friday early morning hour and stole the statue of St. Rita, wife, mother, and widow turned Augustinian nun who was born in Roccaporena in central Italy and was canonized in 1900 as the patron saint of difficult marriages, impossible causes, infertility, and parenthood. The criminals had discarded the statue on the street approximately a mile away in a neighborhood containing many residents who are Antifa members and the members of other similar criminal organizations. A neighbor, after having read a newspaper report of the burglary, spotted the stolen statue and contacted Philadelphia police, who swiftly recovered and safely returned it to the South Philadelphia National Shrine. Representatives of the National Shrine have publicly expressed their sincere appreciation to Philly's finest, the men and women in blue. Indeed, Catholics across the world share in this gratitude for the heroics of the Philadelphia Police Department in this matter and their continued service to Philadelphia's victimized law-abiding citizens. The Italian, Italian-American, and Catholic communities wait with bated breath for Philadelphia's mayor and other officials to decry the crime as a hate crime, as was done regarding a recent vandalization of a mural of George Floyd. So far, no local officials have made any such statement characterizing the burglary of the statue of the Italian saint as a hate crime, nor did any local officials do so in 2018, after the tripartite desecration of Philadelphia's Marconi Plaza Christopher Columbus statue, Penn's Landing Christopher Columbus Monument, and History of Italian Immigration Museum, a Philadelphia museum that had nothing to do with Columbus, but rather memorialized the history and artifacts of Italian immigration to the United States. Since the 2018 tripartite desecrations, however, the History of Italian Immigration Museum has incorporated an exhibit about Italophobia that includes photos of the 2018 acts of desecration, as well as a new exhibit entitled Christopher Columbus, the first founding father and first civil rights activist of the Americas. You can see this exhibit firsthand in Philadelphia at Philitalia International's History of Italian Immigration Museum at 1834 East Pashonk Avenue in South Philadelphia at the intersection of Pashonk Avenue and Mifflin Streets. In Brantford, Connecticut, the Board of Education has changed the name of Christopher Columbus Day so that it shares the holiday name with Indigenous Peoples Day. The Italian American One Voice Coalition is petitioning to move the holiday, celebrating the tribal peoples of the Americas, to the day after Thanksgiving, which is already federally recognized as Native American Day, so that the rights of Italian Americans and the tribal peoples of the Americas, quote, are equally respected and dignified without any additional costs to the school district, end quote. You can voice your support for the IAOVC's petition by emailing Board of Education Chairman John Prins at jprins 
at branfordschools.org. That's jprins, J-P-R-I-N-S, an odd spelling, at branfordschools.org. Note that Branford has no D in the middle, only at the end, B-R-A-N-F-O-R-D, branfordschools.org. Or you can reach Chairman Prins by phone at 203-623-6191. That's 203-623-6191. In Stonington, Connecticut, the school board has reversed the school district's decision to change Columbus Day to the misnomer Indigenous Peoples Day after a deluge of people called school board secretary Heidi Simmons to tell her they were upset about the holiday name change. So... At the next school board meeting, Secretary Simmons, to her credit, introduced a motion to restore the holiday. And the Board of Education voted 3-2 to restore the holiday's name to Christopher Columbus Day. In an article reporting on the matter, the Connecticut Post revealed that, quote, ideas central to critical race theory are being taught to kindergarten to 12th grade public school students, end quote. And in the last of our Connecticut news pieces, in New Haven, Connecticut, a panel has voted to replace that city's Christopher Columbus statue with a statue of Italian immigrants entitled Indicando la Via al Futuro, or Pointing the Way to the Future, a veiled indication of the Marxist tack to placate Italian Americans with replacement statues and holidays to distract them from the falsehood of portraying Christopher Columbus as a racist, rapist, maimer, murderer, slaver, slave owner, grifter, genocide heir. And make no mistake about it, the statue showing a family of Italian immigrants arriving in America with their suitcases as the father holds his young son who is pointing to something in the distance should be erected in New Haven, Connecticut. But in addition to the statue of Christopher Columbus, not in place of it, Italian Americans will not be fooled. We will not accept this tack of placation in order to erase Christopher Columbus because next, It'll be the erasure of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and other great American icons. In fact, that campaign has already started with the call to remove the statue of Abraham Lincoln in Boston and the actual removal of George Washington's likeness from the football helmets of George Washington University and replacing this meaningful image with a meaningless cartoon hippopotamus. In Westerly, Rhode Island, a 14-year-old girl and a 13-year-old boy were arrested and charged for throwing eggs at and graffitiing with spray paint that city's Christopher Columbus statue. In a statement to police, the prepubescent perps told police they were motivated by concerns with racial issues across the country. So just in case you had any doubt, Here's a perfect example of how critical race theory and other Marxist lies in our schools are turning our children in America into ignoramuses and criminals. Westerly Police Chief Sean Lacey said that additional charges may be filed against the youths depending on the final assessment of damage to the statue and the cost to restore it. In Patterson, New Jersey, the Italian-American One Voice Coalition and other New Jersey-based Italian-American groups banded together to denounce the replacement by that city's school board of Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day slash Italian Heritage Day. IAOVC executive board member Andre Domino, who appeared in episode 10 of Christopher Columbus University, commented, quote, Don't placate us with this bifurcated day for indigenous people and Italian heritage. No other group is told who or how they should celebrate, end quote. Ralph Contini, first national VP of Unico National and chair of its Columbus Day Committee said, quote, the Patterson Board of Education has been influenced by the false narrative about Columbus based on fabrications, end quote. William Schiavella, founder and president of the Italian American Police Society of New Jersey, said, quote, Columbus is an important symbol of acceptance to generations of our ancestors, end quote. For the substantive portion of today's class, we have as a returning guest, my good friend and the man who is quickly rising to prominence as the world's premier Christopher Columbus expert, 
I always say that title is held by Dr. Carol Delaney of Stanford University, who was a guest in our previous class, episode 18. But today's guest is the heir apparent to that title. He has been on our show before in episode five to talk about his wonderful book, Christopher Columbus, The Hero. And I promised then to bring, his, bring him back. And by his graciousness, he is back. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you once again, Rafael Ortiz. Rafael, hello, and thank you for coming back to our show. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. Now, we established last time that you identify as a Puerto Rican of Taino descent. And, you know, this should not be important to point out. But in this time of global Marxist revolution, the Marxists have turned every issue, including the Christopher Columbus issue, into one of racial and ethnic sectarianism. Uh, but you have written several other books besides Christopher Columbus, the hero, which we featured in episode five of CCU. By the way, uh, Rafael, that episode is a fan favorite. Uh, I received information from a female fan who said, and I quote, I liked him. He was calm, even handed and frank. End quote. So uh, the, the results are in, ladies and gentlemen. The ladies love Rafael. So, Rafael, you uh so anyway, you, you wrote uh, other books besides Christopher Columbus, the hero, further debunking the slander levied against Christopher Columbus in recent years. And today, we're actually here to talk about a book that you did not write, but which you did critique. And it's the book that revisionist Howard Zinn plagiarized for his pseudo-historical polemic of people's history of the United States, the book by Zinn's fellow anarcho-communist terrorist, Hans Koenig, titled Columbus, His Enterprise. So some weeks ago, uh, an entertainment website reported, and I reported on it as well on this show, that Cavalry Media plans to air a television series based on Koenig's book in order to push via visual media the big lie that Columbus was a racist, rapist, name or murderer, slave or slave owner, grifter, genocide heir. So... I think it's important to get your take on Koenig's book on which this TV series is going to be based. So you critiqued the book on your website, officialchristophercolumbus.com, where you called out the book as being, quote, pure garbage, making things up and being full of inaccuracies, speculations, innuendos, race baiting, etc. Please tell us about some of these. Okay, so I wrote it on Saturday, March the 2nd, 2019. That's when that article came, the one about uh, the series, uh, the one to make about Christopher Columbus. And uh, I read it, and uh, so I published it. And he, you know, and, and I invite people to come to my website and read it, but... He, he said many things, you know, he, uh, speculations in windows, race baiting. For example, in chapter two, he said that uh, many theories have been suggested. Columbus was a Jew looking for the lost tribe of Israel. Columbus sailed because he had been in Iceland learning about the voyages of the Vikings and so forth. These ideas are either unproven, unproven or downright silly, but I said that he is wrong because those quote unquote downright silly arguments have been proven false by documentation uh, and by serious scholars like Paolo Emilio Taviani. He also said, for example, Columbus did not go to school in Genoa. Uh, he said he learned to read and write much later and was self-taught. And I said, indeed, uh, it would be have been, and, he, and you know, I said that that that's incorrect. Uh, Columbus was, and, you know, he was self-taught, but also the primary sources said uh, that his parents sent him to school as a kid to learn how to read and write. Uh, it's just little things like that, and then the bigger things too. Uh, he also misquoted Columbus several times. The usual thing, you know, like uh, uh, they must be uh, good, uh, they, they would make good servants. You know, Columbus talking about the Tainos, the first time that he saw them, uh, which is not true. He did not say that. 
Yeah, what did he say? Can you tell us, uh, clarify that specific thing? Uh, uh, Columbus did not say they would make fine servants. What he said was that they they must be good servants or fine servants, meaning that, and also if you read everything that Columbus was describing that day, that was the first day that he saw the natives too. Right. Uh, he he described he's describing everything. He described he described the island, the trees, the rivers, the animals he saw, and also how what they look like the Tainos, what they look like, and uh, but also he skipped the part that uh, even though Columbus said that he they were peaceful, which meant that he was received peacefully. It doesn't mean that the Tainos were always peaceful because they did have wars among each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what he meant, that they were peaceful in the sense that he was received. But also they have weapons too, their own you know, weapons. He also, in the same uh, journal entry, he said that they had wounds, meaning the Tainos, they had scars on their bodies because people from other islands came to kidnap them. So he avoided that part. Uh, so he said that they were good, they must be uh, good servants in the sense as uh, someone who served a king. And, and the reason why I know that is because later he talks about when he later meets the chiefs, the Taino chiefs, he also talks about their servants. Back then that was the times of kings and queens, that was not the times of presidents and constitutions. And that's the way that the world was back then. So he's praising them. He was praising them. Uh, he he praised them because they were good people. They, he was received peacefully. He said that they were intelligent people and they would make, they they would become Christians. One day, once they they hear the message, they would become Christians. So all these parts of the what Colombo said, he he actually skipped it. He did not mention any of those things in his book. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. So that that clears that up very well, and that's very well said. Now, uh, speaking of, of the chiefs, you know, to whom the, the, the people that he met were serving, uh, you also mentioned that in chapter three, Koenig claimed, this is, I guess, one of the bigger lies, Koenig claimed that Columbus blamed a local chief. I, I guess he's referring to Guacanagari, but, uh, but I'm not even sure Koenig knew who Guacanagari was. Uh, he says that Columbus blamed a local chief for the shipwreck of the Santa Maria, and you isolate this quote from Koenig, you say, uh, Koenig says, he, meaning Columbus, now tried to convince the Indian chieftain that it was his fault that the ship on its way to the alleged gold fields had run aground. Now, you, you correctly in, in, point out that that's a lie. Um, you know, anyone who's read the primary historical sources, in fact, I'm thinking specifically of Life of the Admiral by Hernando Colon, because uh, Bartolomé de las Casas' History of the Indies uh, doesn't have a lot of information about the first voyage, but Life of the Admiral does. And, it, you know, anybody who's read that primary source knows that that's not at all what happened. In fact, quite the opposite. And I always talk about opposite speak by the Marxists. So this is another example. Quite the opposite. That story is actually a very heartwarming Christmas story. Um, and, you know, I, Rafael, I know you, you, you weren't in the United States during the 1970s, um, and I'm not sure if Puerto Rico was uh, receiving uh, uh, television programs from the from the continent uh, back then, but uh, it was a common trope in 1970s sitcoms to always have a Christmas episode, and I intend to continue that tradition uh, with Christopher Columbus University when the time comes. I'm going to have a Christmas episode, and it's going to feature this story uh, of the Navidad settlement because it's a really touching story of friendship and and sympathy uh, and 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 brotherly love and help between the local chief in question, Guacanagari, and Columbus and his crew. So uh, that that's another lie. And you also say that Koenig selectively quoted Columbus's writings and spun Columbus's struggle with the Hidalgos, the Spanish nobles. Could you tell us a little bit about those things? He never mentioned that Bobadilla, the guy who put Columbus in prison, was full of it. And that was full he, of it, yeah, full of it, yeah. Yeah, he... He removed uh, Columbus from office and the accusations against Columbus, which are the ones that are repeated today by revisionists, were not true. He, he, he did not mention that. That's why you see everywhere that say everywhere that you go, any 
uh, website talking about Christopher Columbus, they always mention that he was accused of mistreatment, but they never t tell you that those accusations were slanders. They were political slanders. Also, let me go back a little bit about back about the December uh, 25th, 1492, about that Conning, he said that Columbus blamed the, the chief because of the shipwreck. That's not true. Uh, in fact, he uh, he blamed the people who were not paying attention. Uh, he told them to never have this young person be on the helm. And that's exactly what they did. Everybody went to sleep and, and the hellman gave the helm to this young man and the ship uh, slowly went and, and shipwrecked. Yeah. So Columbus sent for the chief because uh, they already were trying to be friends. They were friends already. And uh, he, and the chief came and he was even on tears when he saw what happened. Yeah. And uh, he helped Columbus to save all the cargo. Everything was safe. Also, Christopher Columbus, he's the one who introduced not just Christianity, but also Christmas. And that's also that day is the day that he decided to settle in America. That's why I call it the a birth of the new world or something like that. I don't remember even because uh, it's not an accident that even the shipwreck, the, the, the ship that that got destroyed is the Santa Maria, which is Holy Mary. So Holy Mary got destroyed, and that's when Christopher Columbus decided to stay. You know, on the 25th, that's the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, that's when he decided, well, we should stay here. Those are those are beautiful insights, Rafael, and I, I hope you'll permit me to reiterate them on my Christmas episode. That's really lovely. Uh, I, so we, we, we're running out of time, so I want to I want to move on. Um, so it, in, in you point out that uh, Koenig claimed uh, that uh, or that Samuel Elliot Morrison, who was a, a famous historian, said that Columbus committed genocide is it, very briefly. Is that true that Columbus committed genocide? No, no. And how do we know how do we know that's not true? Well, Morrison was quoting from Las Casas, and not everything that Bartolomé de Las Casas said was 100% accurate, and anyone who have read his editorials, they know that. Uh, uh, he said, you know, he was blaming, he was doing exactly what people are doing today. They're blaming Columbus for things that happened decades later in different places, even lands that Columbus never reached. That's what Bartolomé de las Casas was doing, and they claim this uh, false narrative that he killed all the Indians, which is not true. They say also that because they know, you know, that we, the, well, you know, the Tainos, let's say we the Tainos, we don't exist with that name today, but it's because we, they got mixed with the Spaniards and later with the Africans, and that's what formed the different uh, Latino uh, races in different places, but uh, it's just that it, it, they just got mixed and they got different names today. Like today we're called Puerto Ricans. But it, initially, even they tried to, to preserve the race in Puerto Rico in this town called uh, Arecibo, but they decided to keep mixing one another. So that narrative that he uh, he was a genocidal maniac is not true. And also the same in the later when the Spaniards came to the land and, and you know, the diseases kill many people at some point. That's not genocide, that's just uh, plagues. You know, like today, right now we have the COVID-19 killing many people, but that nobody's calling it genocide. Right, yeah. And and Koenig never mentioned the Caribs' actual campaign of genocide by the Ta Tainos by depopulating entire Taino islands well before Columbus yeah. arrived. And you point that out in your critique. But uh, I want to move on because, again, we're running out of time. So in, in chapter 10, you said Koenig suggested in the form of a question whether the name of Columbus Day should be changed. And in fact, you wrote a whole book on that issue titled Columbus Day versus Indigenous Peoples Day, the truth behind the anti-Columbus movement. And I would like to have you back on yet another episode to discuss that book, which can be purchased at your website, officialchristophercolumbus.com or wherever books are sold. Uh, and uh, when I have you back to talk about that book, we'll, we'll get your take on Koenig's question, whether to change the name of Christopher Columbus Day and why. I wanted to do that today, but uh, I want to make this last point. So Koenig's book was written actually before 
Zinn wrote his 1980 pseudo historical polemic of people's history because we know this because Zinn plagiarized large swaths of Koenig's book. And I will talk about that more when uh, hopefully we have Dr. Mary Graybar on as a guest. She's the author of Debunking Howard Zinn, Exposing the Fake History That Turned a Generation Against America, also available where all books are sold. But Koenig's book actually wasn't published until 11 years after Zinn's book was published. And I, I guess they figured no one would notice the large swaths of Zinn's plagiarism 11 years later or that no one would call him on it after he was dead. But anyway, you note in your critique that the 1991 publication of Koenig's book closes with an additional chapter written by another revisionist trying to convince young students that Columbus was a bad guy. Can you briefly tell us about that? Yeah, they they said that what they do, they they do like a little experiment in the schools where someone uh, steal the purse of one of the students and then the teacher says, that's conquest, which is theft, and that's what Columbus was doing back then. Uh, but I say that conquest was universal, and uh, if that's the case, then everybody was a thief back then because each country was trying to conquer each other. I said also that that's what these people are trying to do today with Columbus Day is also conquest because they're trying to conquer us and impose their flags with a different holiday name and a different set of values. I said that even the guy, he's a hypocrite because I find out that he was a socialist. And the socialists themselves, we know that they committed genocide in recent history. We're talking about the Nazis and their cousins, the cousins, their cousins, the communists in Europe and Asia, who did the same. So I said this teacher is, is a hypocrite. So yeah. they're blaming others of the same things that they have done or the same things that they support. Yeah, that's right. You, you, you say in your characteristic humorous style in your critique, because uh, you were talking about this, this uh, classroom experiment where the teacher takes away the student's purse to illustrate that conquest is theft. And you say socialism is actually a better example of someone stealing your purse. And I love that because that's, that's the, the, just the type of pithy uh, uh, humor that, that you find in your books. And I love that. But yeah, people don't realize that the Nazis were socialists. The word Nazi is actually a contraction of the full German word national socialismus, which means national socialism, national socialism. That was the name of the Nazi party, the National Socialist Party. In fact, Kristallnacht or the Night of Broken Glass, sometimes it's also called the November Pogrom, that was when the Nazis raided and demolished Jewish homes and businesses, arrested 30,000 Jews for internment in concentration camps, and confiscated Jewish belongings, artwork, and other personal property. This was actually an act of socialist wealth distribution from the middle-class German citizens of Jewish descent to the German proletariat. And ladies and gentlemen, Raphael's reference to the communists in Europe and Asia, that refers to, among other things, the dekulakization of Soviet Russia, as Alexander Solzhenitsyn characterized it in his book, the Gulag Archipelago, this was the imprisonment of the Kulaks, the landed farmer class of pre-Soviet Russia, resulting in the murder of 20 million Russians in an attempt at socialist wealth redistribution. And Raphael's reference to the Asian uh, socialists is Mao Zedong's great leap forward in an attempt at socialist wealth redistribution in China, which actually murdered 45 million human beings. So Raphael, your point is well taken. And I think it's very important to have well-informed folks like you on Christopher Columbus University because people need to be awakened and informed. And with that, I'm afraid we're out of time. So thank you for coming on our show again and doing just that. And I look forward to having you on again and again to discuss your other books and maybe even, if you're willing, regular appearances down the line to debunk the lies that we can expect from Cavalry Media's upcoming upcoming television show. Is that something you might be willing to do? Yeah, that's fine. And I hope that they won't make that movie anyway. Yeah, I'm hoping, well, yeah, that television says, I'm, I'm hoping they won't. But yeah, you know, with, with the BlackRock funded media, uh, they're on a definite uh, purposeful campaign to destroy Western culture. But that's today's class. For more news, articles, and resources about Christopher Columbus as the first civil rights activist of the Americas, icon of Western culture, paragon of Catholic virtue, and greatest hero of the 15th and 16th centuries, visit 
preservecolumbus.us. That's preserve Columbus, rendered as one word, dot US, and post a little note of appreciation for our webmaster, Tom LaCosta. And also, don't forget to visit uh, Raphael's website, officialchristophercolumbus.com. Did I get that right, Raphael? Yes. Yes, all, all rendered as one word, officialchristophercolumbus.com. And that's it. I'm your professor, Robert Petrone. A presto! This is Radio Voice Italia, USA.